We were talking about when we were in Bolivia together. When I was working in Bolivia and you came and visited me, you started telling me about your first time ever in Bolivia. 1967, mm. many years earlier, newly married. I'd just literally finished university. I was older than most because I, I was brought up in South Africa and we went to England when I was 18 and I had to do A-levels all over again. So I didn't go to university in England until I was 20. So I was what you'd now call a mature student, I guess, though it wasn't that mature. So Caroline, um, you brought these photographs down to Hove to show me. Well, these photographs are extraordinary. They remind me of 1967. It's the story of Bolivia, the killing of Che Guevara, and his body being brought in on a helicopter to Valle Grande, pumping formula into him, and he looks like Jesus Christ. He's only been dead two or three hours. Rigor mortis hasn't set in. And quite extraordinary sight of this man. There seems absolutely no doubt at all that this is Che Guevara. Uh, yes, they're now sitting Che Guevara up, actually sitting him up. Uh, his dead body is now being sat up. It's the most fantastic sight. He's a very pale, ghastly, ghostly yellow colour. Uh, his head has rolled back onto the... The other photo which I always find so moving is the one of his feet. He was very, very ill in battle. He had asthma and he could no longer wear shoes. So he's got these socks and moccasins that are wrapped around his feet. It's a, it's, a, it's a photograph that Brian took. So Brian was Brian Moser and he was the man that I married in 1967. He was a world in action um, documentary filmmaker, uh, Granada Television. And we married in a pretty conventional way, a wonderful white dress and a veil and big reception and all of that. And I thought, right, this is marriage, and now what do we do? Um, I discussed and thought about signing on for a graduate master's course in anthropology. And then out of the blue, um, Brian started to talk about the fact that there was a chap called Che Guevara who was running a guerrilla movement in Bolivia. And I thought, goodness, who's Che Guevara? Never heard of him. Where's Bolivia? I mean, I knew Africa, but I didn't know Latin America at all. Anyway, within a few weeks, Brian went off because he went with a couple of colleagues on the basis that there was going to be a really, could be a very good story there. So off he went to Bolivia and sent me a telegram a few days later saying, come now, I won't see you till the middle of November. So I decided, well, I'm going to go. So I let our little cottage and went down to London and had my hair straightened and got myself a Jaeger suit and some wonderful Russell and Bromley boots. These are the things I could never afford, of course, being a university student. So suddenly a young married woman, I could go out and treat myself. And off I went to Bolivia on a plane. Did you speak Spanish? I didn't speak a word of Spanish um, and I had no idea where I was going. I was going to, going to the unknown and to arrive 13, 11,000 feet in La Paz, as you know, I mean, it's, it's like being on the moon. You told me earlier that Brian had you know, been at Valle Grande and taken those fantastic photographs of, of Che's death. But what was going to happen now once you'd arrived in Bolivia? We went to Santa Cruz to film the Green Berets and, and, the, and the troops, uh, the Bolivian uh, troops that had actually captured and killed Guevara. At that point, Ridges de Bray's trial, which had been sort of going on for a few months, was reaching a critical point. Mr. Bray was a French revolutionary, uh, very famous. He had written a very important book called Revolution in the Revolution and was a sort of philosopher thinker who had been in the jungle with Guevara and had left it along with an Argentinian called Bustos and they had both been captured coming out of the jungle and then held in Camiri and then very sort of 
in a laborious manner were then being put on trial, and it was a sort of show trial. It had gone on for months, by which time most of the world press had left, but fortunately coincided with us being in Santa Cruz. So Brian really decided we had to get there. So he chartered a little plane, a Cessna, and it turned out that it wasn't a five-seater, it was only a three-seater. He looked at his crew and he looked at his equipment and he looked at me and he said, oh, well, she can wait and stay. I said, no, this is history. I'm going to be there. This is one of the things that I want to do in my life. And I want to be at Camiri and I want to get to register those trial. So off I went with just the clothes I stood up in. And that's how I got to Camiri. <laughs> Um, and it, it was for me an, really an exponential experience, I think, because there we had the sort of romantic French revolutionary um, on trial um, in a Bolivian court in the middle of the jungle. Uh, Camiri was an oil town. Um, and it, it, was, it was very, very profound in terms of one seeing the reality of sort of revolutionaries who got caught, who got captured, and who were put on trial. Mm. Um, my own experience was, was quite interesting because I was Brian's wife, um, and I had no real formal, formal title, but I was a member of the film crew. And actually, I was the sort of gopher and the, and the sort of run arounder. And so every time there was something really difficult to do, I got to do it. Um, when we went into Kamiri... Why did you get to do it? Because it was difficult? I got to do it because I was, I was sort of invisible. I was there, but I wasn't, I wasn't identifiably there. I was a wife, I was just a young woman really, I mean I was a young 24 year old and uh, nobody really noticed me. And so so we, one of the things we did was that Brian persuaded um, Ricky Turan, the, the colonel in charge of, at Kamiri, that we should go inside Debray's cell and film him inside his cell and show the world that the conditions in which he lived were not, were quite okay. So we went inside his cell and I was the lights, the woman with the lights, I had the battery belts around my waist. And my instructions from Brian was blind, blind the, the, the young corporals, the Bolivian soldiers, because he was busy passing a note from actually we from from the Russell Peace Foundation to uh, Debray. We were the first people who'd been inside his his cell in about three months. It turned out, and so we didn't realize. I didn't realize at the time what this was really about. I don't know that Brian really did. Brian swore to me that he never read the note, but it currently became it, it came from Fidel Castro. Is that the kind of thing that journalists are meant to do? No, of course it's not. And I mean that was Brian was a, an extremely. Um, uh, exciting um, person who enjoyed the sort of the, the buzz of doing these these highly dangerous um, things and involved those who were around him in doing them with with him. Uh, and you were enjoying it as well. Uh, did I enjoy it? I don't know that I enjoyed it. I found it really quite. I'm not. I'm not as fearless as he is. He's totally fearless. I'm not as fearless. I found it very very exciting. I found it, one felt one was living in the moment and one was doing something that was part of history, which it was. And, and then, of course, what happened was, having shot this film, he wanted to get it out of Kamiri before the, before the military got hold of it. So again, I was this sort of invisible wife and I went out with it on my own um, because nobody would stop me and nor did they. I never really gave myself recognition for having been part of something that was so profound. And when I came to Bolivia and met you again, after all those years, I remember recounting it and remembering it and saying, gosh, that was really important. And it profoundly me effectively partly because it really politicized me. I mean, I'd been brought up in South Africa. I, I, as a child, I knew about apartheid. Um, but I had never been at the cutting edge of a real political uh, experience like that. And really, and I hadn't been in Latin America at all. And I hadn't experienced Latin American Marxism. And it, it politicized me. At the same time, it also, I think, from there began my, a lot of my feminism and my recognition of the role of women in these in these um, experiences. As you can see in the photograph 
of 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 Che Guevara's feet. There are the there's Che Guevara with his feet wrapped up in socks that we I always thought were the socks of the the combatant, the guerrilla woman Tanya. Now Tanya was an East German um, spy, and she was in the jungle. There's never been much concern about her except that she potentially was a lover of Guevara's. She wasn't his lover. She was actually a, a revolutionary in her own right. She'd been trained in East Germany. She'd gone to Cuba. She had worked as a professional revolutionary. She'd been recruited by uh, Fidel and by, by, by Che Guevara to go before he went to La Paz to set up the whole mission in 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 Bolivia. Um, very extraordinary woman in her own right. But I think what it showed me was the way that women are sort of present but not present. They're invisibilized. And Got her socks on Che's well, feet. Well, you see, the story about Che's feet and the socks are interesting because I always remember that photograph, which I've seen since 1967. I always thought that these were Tanya's socks. And so for me, this was the symbol of her nurturing and caring for this guy in the jungle when he was very, very ill. Now, Brian tells me they couldn't have been her socks because he took those photos and they were large male green and gray socks. But for me, they were her socks as a symbol and they symbolized her involvement in that, in that um, whole struggle. Um, which is very different from the political history that's been written, because in the political history she's she's either ironed out or she's she's actually really castigated because she did some pretty stupid things and they found her jeep and they identified her and therefore it gave the the military and the CIA enormous evidence. Why it was so symbolic for me was that actually after that experience I then went and worked in Colombia later. And I became very close to women ex-combatants, as they were called, particularly one. And again, she had had been extremely important in the in the in the guerrilla movement of which she was part. But she became airbrushed out and invisibilized. And again, there was this sort of idea that really they were just um, you know lovers or sex interests or or as indeed one is has happened recently again with women coming out of the FARC. So for me, it's a pattern that has repeated and itself. The pattern is also you're yeah. there as the invisible woman at this event yeah got airbrushed yes out. yes i think there's an extraordinary not a parallel because i wasn't i wasn't a important or a combatant or anything but there's a there's a for me there's an interesting parallel that as women we participate in in events uh we are there we're present but because of the roles and the identities we have we don't actually um really appear and we probably don't give ourselves, in my case I'm talking about now, we don't give ourselves ownership of what we actually have done. And that's why later in my own life, I did things in my own right. And um, in order to take ownership and sort of feel my own identity about, about what I did. And my work in Colombia with women ex-combatants was very much something I did with them and, and very, very interesting. Now, these were women who'd been combatants, but were still struggling with what it was like to come back in and become visible having been so invisible in the world that they had been in. So in many ways that experience had an enormous long-term effect on your own way of thinking and the choices you subsequently made. After a year away in, in South America, we came back to England um, and, and I felt totally different from my university friends. My level of understanding of, of exploitation, but also of power and of the CIA and of the American imperialism, and which of course then, you know, one matured a lot about in the 70s when I became a Marxist. Uh, but those were, those were the roots of it in mm. that experience. Are you, are you still a Marxist? I let go of my Marxism and I became a feminist. That's what happened. The Marxists were pretty dreadful about feminism anyway. I became much more interested in 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 uh, in feminism and what feminism was about, I think. <laughs> <laughs>
hasta siempre comandante. Aquí se queda la clara, la entrañable transparencia. 